Hi there, Scott Hamilton, Rockfile, back with another podcast review for your ears, going to be talking about 2001's Rockstar. Man, I haven't seen this movie in a very long time. It was in a box that I moved with me, pulled it out, and I keep, ah, I'll watch it later. Ah, I'll watch it later. I, I, I have good memories of it, but I really don't remember much about it. I mean, it, I remember liking Mark Wahlberg's performance. I remember there were a bunch of rock stars actually in the movie, but I haven't seen it in a long time. It came out in 2001. The Blu-ray came out in 2014. I'll do a little Blu-ray review in here, too. Uh, short version is, if you've never seen the movie, it's actually kind of sweet. <laughs> it's 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 kind of a romance at its heart and, and, you know, following your dreams and all that kind of stuff. It also wants to be something else, so it's kind of, it, it kind of mixed in tone uncomfortably. But at an hour and 46 minutes, it's still entertaining. So getting into the movie... Um, the first thing I noticed, it's very soft-looking Blu-ray. Um, I'm watching all Blu-rays and 4Ks through a, 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 an OK. Uh, I think it's the uh, Sony 700 uh, 4K Blu-ray player. And it up-converts and sometimes applies Dolby Vision HDR to standard def or standard high def Blu-rays. Um, sometimes my lights will pop on. I'm like, well, that actually looks not bad. I recently watched X-Men Apocalypse on Blu-ray and it looked great. Like there's almost no need to upgrade to 4K, a lot of detail. Um, so I put this movie in and man, it's really soft at the beginning. The titles and stuff, just really, really almost DVD soft, not pixelated, just Wow. Uh, the movie got better as it went along. There was some good detail, especially in brightly lit shots on stage and outside. But um, as, as Blu-rays go, it's kind of an older encode. It just it looked soft most of the time. Concert shots look pretty darn good. Uh, so this movie could definitely use an upgrade as far as video goes if they <laughs> Warner Brothers decides to put it on 4K. The movie was a box office flop, so probably not. Um, the sound was pretty good. Um, it's a 5.1 mix. Um, it was pretty thunderous when it needed to be for the most part. Trevor Rabin, guitar player for Yes and, and has done a lot of movie soundtracks, did the soundtrack, the actual music. Um, and I think they captured the era and the sound that they were going for. It's There's some very interesting choices I'll get into in the movie. And I'm not going to get into heavy spoilers or anything. But the movie's over 20 years old, so you should have seen it by now. Um, Mark Wahlberg is fantastic in the main role. Matter of fact, he's so good at lip syncing, you'd think he's actually singing. I mean, he's great. He really, really is great. They got the guy from Steel Heart. I've interviewed him and talked to him. I did a giveaway with one of his guitars once. He's a nice guy. Um, a couple of the other people in that. The most striking thing in the movie is Zach Wilde is in it a lot with no beard. In 2001, Zach Wilde did not have a beard. He's got the outfit. He's got the long hair, the stance. He plays guitar the same way. He shakes his head and bow, you know, bounces his hair and all that. But no beard. And he's actually a good-looking guy. you know. So it's interesting. He's had a beard for so many years. You don't know what he looks like without it. Um, the lead singer of Third Eye Blind plays a lead singer who takes over in a, in a tribute band. Um, there's people from all sorts of other bands. Uh, lead singer of Verb Pipe wrote one of the songs, does the voice for the song at the end when he leaves the band and does something a little more uh, 90s-ish. But going back to the music, um, there's a lot of montages in the movie. Stephen Herrick directed this. He's the guy who directed the first Bill and Ted. He directed a lot of Disney movies. Uh, Mr. Holland's Opus and a few others did really well. He directed the 101 Dalmatians with Glenn Close that was very popular. He, he did, And after Rockstar, he... Hmm, he didn't really make too many more good movies and started making bad movies like Into the Deep 2. Um, and his most recent movie is something I'd never even heard of. It doesn't have any stars in it. I, mm. But anyway, um, he does fine with it. Matter of fact, I, I thought, you know, overall, they capture the hair band ethic in the 90s as it was, as things were changing. Uh, the movie starts in the mid 80s and goes up through the 90s. Um, but there's a lot of montages to other bands' music. Now, the few, Steel Dragon is the name of the band. Oh, and by the way, there's the side story is this is supposed to be a loosely um, based, a loosely translated version of the story of the lead singer who took over for Rob Halford and Judas Priest, that he was a fan singer. And, and this happened in real life to Journey. 
you know, Journey found a YouTube singer, and that he's the guy singing at Journey these days. So this story actually came true more than once in real life. But Mark Wahlberg plays a guy who's in a tribute band for Steel Dragon, the fictitious band that's in there that Zach Wilde plays for, and these other. Timothy Oliphant plays a guitar player in this long hair. It's funny. Um, uh, Jason Fleming plays a long haired lead singer, too. And they've got all, they all lip sync and they all do a great job. But like I said, Mark Wahlberg is so good at it. Um, you'd think he really was singing through the entire movie. And there's some outtakes, cut out scenes towards over the credits at the end. And they start playing his Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. And, and everybody's dancing around stage. It had to be fun. To, but anyway, uh, he's probably good at lip syncing for all those videos he did. Um, Jennifer Aniston is in this movie. She's very cute. She's very good in the movie. And she goes brawless in a couple scenes. And it's impressive. You know, <laughs> go, you know, kudos. Um I don't know that too many other actresses at the time would have worked in it because she's the right amount of serious, sad, supportive. She hasn't made a whole lot of movies after Friends, and I guess this was during, um, but she's good in this, really good. Everybody else doesn't get a lot to do. Um, it's interesting. Dominic West plays... Um, what, the leader of the band who's not the lead singer of Steel Dragon. And he's probably got the biggest role outside of the manager with the really bad teeth. And All the band members do a great job. Uh, Zach Wilde actually has some speaking parts, and on stage he's great. But going back to the music uh, again, um, there's a lot of montages to Def Leppard, to Poison. Uh, the songs were strong. They, they wrote songs for the movie, and there are big montages as Steel Dragon gets more popular over the years with Mark Wahlberg's character as the front man. Um, but they play that to, you know, Let's Get Rocked and other songs that are not Steel Dragon songs. It would have helped to, I don't know, the dramatic illusion if those had been Steel Dragon songs. Because the one song that they play more than once that he sang in the audition to get the role is a great song in that genre of music. And, there should, and they what they played on stage, there was maybe three songs that Steel Dragon play in the movie. Everything else is somebody else's song over a montage of them doing stuff on stage and then backstage and then with groupies and then on the road. And there really was, it was noticeable in an hour and 40 minute movie to have as many montages as they did. But it's a, it's a music movie. So where the movie doesn't work, it, it works because Mark Wahlberg's good. Jennifer Aniston's good. They're very real and down to earth in their roles. Um, the idea that he's in a tribute band and he becomes the lead singer of his favorite band and then eventually, you know, what their relationship goes through and all that. That's part of what's good and bad about the movie. The movie wants to be not quite Spinal Tap, but it wants to be one of those crazy rock and roll movies. Uh, you remember in 2000, it was Detroit Rock City. I think it came out in 1999, 2000, where a bunch of kids back in the 70s wanted a road trip to a Kiss concert. That was a little more wild and crazy than this was. It tries. And then it tries to be a realistic depiction of what goes on backstage. And, and of that, it, it gets mostly right. You have all these other rock stars <laughs> playing these side roles who probably went, no, we wouldn't do that back there. Yes, that's exactly what it's like back there kind of thing. Um, they blew, blow some things out of proportion. If you've been backstage, you know it's not always the most exciting thing. Maybe it was in the 70s and early 80s. But when I started in the mid-80s going backstage, it's you know dudes hanging out waiting go on stage and that's it's about the excitement of it uh warming up and that kind of thing but overall the movie is still very entertaining um it fits because it, it wasn't at, it wasn't current at the time it's taking place in the past so it works like any other movie like the godfather or whatever if you watch it now um and I, I was very entertained by the movie. A few pacing issues. It takes a little while to get going. We, we, we get really into his downtrodden life where his brother questions his sexuality and gives him a hard time about being in a rock band and, uh, you know, working at a menial job, fixing copiers. And somebody noticed he's got eyeliner on. He goes, I'm in a band, you know. And it's just like they had a hard time juxtaposing the, the comedy with the seriousness of it and the heartfelt of it and... I mean, it all does kind of work. It all came together. It, it, it just didn't reach classic status. It's, it's almost there, but not quite. But there's so many good things about it. Like I said, the performances are great. The music is great. Um, most of the pacing is good once it gets going. Um, and the montages are well done. I didn't mean to disparage montages. I just think they should be used you know, sparingly as a directoral 
directorial tool to get something across, to tell time and things going on and things like that. I do get it. But this was like montage after montage after montage. But anyway, um, I still like the movie a lot. It does need uh, either a refresh or a 4K upgrade. Not that it ever will. Had a production budget of $59, $60 million, only grossed $19 million back in 2001. So didn't do very well and kind of hurt the director's career after that. If you look at the movies he made, some pretty high profile stuff and not so much after. Afterwards, But um, if you're a fan of rock music in general or the actors, this is still a very viable movie 20 years later. It's uh, good performances, um, fun times, some, you know, some serious stuff. Spinal Tap had some serious stuff, too, but always did the comedy better. I don't know. Maybe the difference is it was a fully improvised movie for the most part. But. Rockstar holds up in a lot of ways. The Blu-ray could use a refresh video-wise. The soundtrack was pretty fine um, and funny. You know, at times you thought Mark Wahlberg really was singing. If you haven't seen it in years, pull it out, check it out. It's on streaming services and shocked. It actually came with a digital copy. Warner Brothers didn't do that much in 2014. So there's that. When I pulled up the Blu-ray tonight, a little piece of paper fell out. And I'm like, oh, wow. Didn't even think this had. That was back before they put that as a selling point on the cover of the Blu-ray. That's how old that is. Um, this was an early Blu-ray, I guess. Anyway, um, does need an upgrade, but you could probably find it in the 5 to $7 bin at most Walmarts these days. So check it out. Mark Wahlberg um, with long hair and in a hair rock band. Rock star. I'm Scott Hamilton. I'm Rockfile. Thanks for checking out the podcast. We've got more on the way. Check out my links below and have a spectacular rockin' day.